A little song, song come called a non dual non dual fish. Funny, funny name. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, we have a book of that poem of Thai, non dual a fish, and with the translation into Vietnamese and English and everything. <clears throat> You are a fish man. I am a fish. You are beautiful. I am beautiful. Your skin is so wonderfully brown because you are under the sunshine. And I am a beautiful fish. I lie down on the deck of your boat. I'm caught. And other fish are trying to struggle to liberate themselves. I look deeper. Maybe I don't need. Because you need to fish me in order to have some money to fish, to feed, to feed your children and your family. I offer something but make you happy. That's enough. Tôi đã chết rồi, nhưng mắt tôi chưa nhắm. I die already, but I do not close my, my eyes. When you go to the market, you buy a fish, you have to choose the fish where the eyes still open. So they are just die, and their flesh are still excellent. But if the fish already like that, it smells bad. And so the fish described that I do not close my eyes, it means I'm still very fresh. Huh? Buy me, quick, quick, <laughs> in order to have a good meal of dish, of, uh, of fish dish. You are a fisherman who fish a lot of little fish on the high, high ocean. And lần dân trên đường sâu kéo lưới nước da em. The fish call the 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 the, the fish call the fisherman. Em, it means young brother. Nước da em thơm mùi biến mặn Những bắp thịt em cuồng tròn dưới nắng Your muscles, comment on dit en français? Your muscles are very beautiful, brown. Tôi là con cá thu, vậy vì lập lành Dạy 
dừa tuyệt vọng cùng với hàng ngàn con cá khác trong lòng lưỡi em căng I am a young a young fish too with a lot of color beautifully but we are struggling together with other fish to feel to be liberated but it's not easy your network is so powerful everywhere and okay accept to ready to die em là con cá tôi tôi em là ngư dân trên biển sâu kéo lưới nước da em thơm mùi biển mặn your skin smell the high ocean như bắp thịt em Cuộn tròn như nắng Tôi là con cá thu Vây vì lấp lên Dãy dừa tuyệt vọng Struggling hardly Cùng với hàng ngàn con cá khác Trong lòng lưỡi em căng Tôi nằm hấp hối trên khoang thuyền em phải bắt tôi vì sự sống của em I'm dying on the deck of your boat but I look deeply and I see that I must die for you to live you need money to feed your family and you need me in order to feed your family Em phải bắt tôi vì sự sống của em. Em cũng là người thiếu phụ. Ở ngoài chờ sắp gió đứng nhìn. And then people bring me to the market and laying down along for many mother of the family go around and buy fish. And I wait for somebody to pick me up. And I thought, tried to communicate with the lady who was about to buy me. Tôi đã chết rồi, nhưng mắt tôi chưa nhắm. Thịt tôi còn thơm lắm. My, my, my flesh is still smell good. Mang tôi vẫn còn đỏ hồng Em mua tôi về Chặt tôi ra làm nhiều mảnh Bỏ vô nồi Búi cơm chiều Ấm áp mùa đông You buy me Because I do not die totally yet My eyes still open I still fresh And you buy me in order to make a good meal for your family. Có tôi, em và các con em Có mâm cơm nóng Dưới mái tranh Mọi người ấm bùng With me, you can make delicious dishes For your family, a kind of soup a kind of car, I mean, it's excellent. Don't wait. Em mua tôi về, chặt tôi ra làm nhiều mảnh. Bỏ vô nồi, bùi cơm. Bùi Nobody want to kill the fish. <laughs> In the song is about we cut the fish into little piece. <laughs> no, no. Bưởi con chiều ấm áp mùa đông. Có tôi 
em và các con em có mầm cơm nóng dưới mái tranh mọi người ấm bùng còn ai nhận được ra tôi nữa chung như bụng rồi sao nhận được <cười> khi sắc không ấn hiện xoay vòng một <cười> Một trăm ngàn kiếp làm thân con cá biển, cá sông. Tôi đã vào ra bơi lội thông dông. Nhà cửa không gian có khi đẹp hơn là bích ngọc. Nhà cửa của mấy con cá dưới sông. Thế giới của tôi có đủ màu xanh, màu đỏ, màu hồng. Và tôi đã học thuộc lòng bài học bỉ thử anh và tôi dung thông. Để mỗi khi xa vào lưới được chết thông dông. Không hận thù, không tuyệt vọng. Bởi vì tôi biết sự sống của anh là sự chết của tôi. Mọi loài tương tức Tôi và em dung thông Ác lại Em là ngữ dân Trên biển sâu keo lưới Nước da em thơm mùi biếng măng Những bập thịt em Cuồn tròn dưới nắng Tôi là con cá thu Vậy vì lập lanh Dãy dùa tuyệt vọng Cùng với hàng ngàn con cá khác Trong lòng lưới em căng Tôi nằm hấp hối Trên khoang thuyền Em phải bắt tôi vì sự sống của em. Em cũng là người thiếu phụ ở ngoài chờ sách gió đứng nhìn. Tôi đã chết rồi nhưng mắt tôi chưa nhắm. Thịt tôi còn thơm lắm. Mang tôi vẫn còn đỏ hồng Em mua tôi về Chặt tôi ra làm nhiều mảnh Bó vô nồi Búi cơm chiều Ấm áp mùa đông Có tôi Em và các con em Có mâm cơm nóng dưới mái tranh mọi người ấm bùng còn ai nhận được ra tôi nữa khi sắc không ấn hiền xoay vòng một trăm ngàn kiếp làm thân con cá biển cá sông Tôi đã vào ra bơi lội thông dông Nhà cửa không gian có khi đẹp hơn là bích ngọc Thế giới của tôi cũng có đủ màu xanh, màu đỏ, màu hồng Và tôi đã học thuộc lòng bài học bị thử dung thông để mỗi khi xa vào lưới được chết thông dông không hận thù không tuyệt vọng bởi vì tôi biết sự sống làm bằng sự chết cái có làm bằng cái không mọi loài tương tức Tôi và em dung thông.
Where is the little book? <laughs> there is a good news that if you don't have something to record, here there is a sign, and then you can listen. I don't know what kind of uh, you use, but they can make the music in the sign same time than the poem. And so you, even you don't have any material. Oh God, God. Anyway, is uh, you already have that in your heart? Thank you for listening. Joy, we are question and answer for other brother and sister. Please come. Good I know. Please come, other brothers and sisters, and Thầy gì nữa? Please come. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Shiko Jankong, uh, for offering your presence. Mm. For those who arrived today, uh, we're very fortunate to have Shiko with us. It's, uh, I think, it's Mother's Day. <laughs> so appropriate. She's the Sangha mom. Uh, she is the. This morning we transmitted the 14 mindfulness training for how many OI members? About 10 or so? 11. And Sister Chang Kong is the first OI member. So not so long ago, there was a war in our country and Thai formulated this training so that we can help bring peace and to bring spirituality to the struggle for peace. So this is the lineage that you just joined. Those who are this morning did the prostration. So we're very lucky to have uh, the root of our tradition, the OI tradition. It's a very engaged and fierce uh, tradition. Uh, very go places that are very scary. And I think uh, you, uh, our world needs more bodhisattva. Uh, people who are awake. So the 11 of you, you have the name uh, Rain in your name, right? Rain of peace, rain of insight. Because this year in California, we had a lot of rain. So know that you are a product of the season. <laughs> I heard it was a 50-year cycle. So it took 50 years to produce you guys. So please bring more calm, coolness in our world right now. It's very divided and very hot with a lot of uh, ideology. So please, um, 
And we're very lucky to have Shiko here to witness and to transmit and to offer you her presence. Mm. So you are like the branches and Shiko a very deep root into Mother Earth. And so they, today we pay tribute to Mother Earth. And before we start, let's uh, honor all our mothers. We've come from somewhere and not some uh, idea, but we come from our mother's womb, our father and mother's love. And so we can sit here and let's uh, breathe with the sound of the bell. My brother, Brother Nyak Hu, will invite three sounds of the bell. And I see children here. Everyone can put your index finger, everyone, including the big children. You still are a child because you have an umbilical cord. You put your index finger, you press your uh, belly button. You will ever want to come in touch with your mom? This is the little app. <laughs> yes. Because uh, even though maybe she gave you a hard time, your dad gave you a hard time, but she loved you right when you came out. And even though the umbilical cord is cut, you can always uh, know that it, she gave birth to you, gave you this life. And let's come back to that gratitude. So we can put our hand gently there. And seriously, uh, you know, that index finger is an awareness that we didn't come from not nothing. We came from a place of love. Our mother held us for the first time tenderly. And our own mother and her grandmother, all the mothers also came from Mother Earth right beneath us the mother of all mother, our environment, the birds, the mountain, the air, the earth, to produce all the carrots, the rice and tofu for us. So we come in touch with every breath, every rising and falling of our belly. Dear mother, I touch your love. your practice. Mm. Thank you for coming for uh, to celebrate today mm, to be with the Sangha and some of you uh, might not know who arrived today. We, some of us have been here since Wednesday or Thursday. We had a mini retreat 
And so today is the last day for uh, those who have been here. So today we have a question and answer for those who have been practicing uh, with us, as well as open up for anyone else. Um, so uh, we can come up here and um, ask uh, one question about our practice, something happening in our lives, something happening in our family, in our emotion, in our journey. So please uh, ask a question from your heart. And if it's uh, scary, that's a good question. If you're afraid to ask it, that means it's a good question. That's why it's called a practice, to share that difficulty and then uh, ask for help. I see from our, our experience, the monks and nuns up here, and we try our best to, to share from our experience. And, and please uh, uh, remind everyone that the, a good question doesn't have to be long. And same thing with an answer, it doesn't have to be long. So we'll ask uh, one person to ask a question and then one of us will share and then we'll continue with that. So if you have a question, please uh, come up and you can bring your cushion and sit behind here so it can save some time. So we can uh, begin right away. And before each question, you, we can invite a bell. And uh, to honor our mothers, we have children here because they are part of the mother. So if any children want to ask a question, we have uh, one opportunity, or maybe two. Anybody brave? You ever want to ask uh, the monks and nuns any question? This is your chance. But you have to come up here and sit at the chair. Yes, I give you an uh, opportunity, just in case there is a curious question out there. No? Okay, too scary. <laughs> you can ask us after, okay? So for those who uh, who've been the retreat with us, please come on up. This is a uh, a wonderful, special opportunity. Yeah, please uh, bring your cushion. Walk up mindfully. question um, how do I accept that I will die and practice with my uh, fear of it Dear respected Thai, dear Sangha, dear friends, dear Jerry. Jerry is a Sangha friend and we know him very well. He's a very talented beatboxer. So you could just beatbox till the end of your days and make everyone happy. <laughs> you know, there's a lot to say about this and I have to choose where I'm gonna go fishing 
in my heart and in my consciousness. And I believe when you ask yourself that question, there are many places to go. And this can be overwhelming. And this is where this uncertainty and this fear comes from. And let me start with Charlie Brown and Snoopy, <laughs> just to have a light beginning, because I remember fishing in my mind. There was uh, an image of the two of them talking philosophically, and Snoopy said, no, Charlie Brown said, you know, one day we all gonna die. And Snoopy looked back at him and said, you know, that's true but all other days we're going to live. <laughs> all other days, there's only one day we're dying. <laughs> and it's most likely not today. <laughs> yeah. And that brings us to the teachings of Tay, you know, Tay, whatever we said and asked about the future, about death, about reincarnation, he always brought us back gently and said, don't you worry, you know? what counts most is here and now, and what counts most is what you do here and now, and how you are here and now. And Tay taught us that we take care of the future by taking care of ourselves in the present moment. If I may say, if you waste your time on fear about the future, I say waste because you're not living all these days, but you're looking forward to that one day of all days and you're taking away the chance of this day to show its beauty to you, to show its richness, its colors, its joy, then you're missing out something. So the practice would be to establish yourself deeply, you know, so deep into today and so deeply into this hour and so deeply into this minute, and so deeply into this very moment, that it ripples out, that you're in the center of this moment, and it ripples out into your life, and you cannot even like see the, that day when you're gonna die, or how you're gonna die, or why you're gonna die. And besides that, with all this AI stuff, we don't even we're not even sure if we're going to die. Maybe they just transfer our consciousness into a, a next Jerry body, you know, and you continue, you die, but nobody realizes you're beatboxing and you just continue beatboxing, but it's a new life. <laughs> so it's, it's not even certain, you know, what's going to happen. So don't spend too much time, but come back to this moment. See, this is a legendary moment. Suko Chankom is here. We are all, this is a mindfulness festival. This, Every moment bears wonders, miracles, joys. Go and find them. Come back to yourself and find them. Does that help? Check it out, bro. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, my question has to do with 
friends and addiction. Um, I have a friend who has a problem and he knows he has a problem, but he, um, he's not ready to make the change. So I'm confused because there's these uh, in here, it seems like the way to help a friend is uh, with love and understanding and being there. Um, but sometimes I also hear from the outside, you know, you got to cut them off so that you don't enable them. So how can you be there for your friend and help, um, help them get their change? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, Sometimes, uh, this is from my own experience, when I have my own habits and I don't want to listen to my sisters. She grew up, I mean, I grew up with her, so I know. Um, that stubbornness, I find, is not because I do not know. Sometimes I find when somebody tells me that, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that, th there's this pride that comes up and says, no, I'm fine, I can take care of myself. And I push everyone away. So how do I help a friend that is like that? Is that I... You don't come to them saying that you should do this to make you a better person. But sometimes it's more like, can I listen to you? Because when we want to help someone, we impose our ideas of what that person is going through more than we are listening to them. And being there in our practice is not just being there and just chilling and hanging out and watching TV and doing nothing. Um, sometimes being there is absolutely doing nothing at all and just sitting and allowing yourself to listen to you at the same time creating space for them to be heard. Because I know that sometimes we cannot be heard. Even if we wanted to say something, we cannot say it out. But if we feel that we are being attacked, if we feel that we are being judged, because right now in society, almost everybody feels that way. They are comparing themselves. How come you're not like your sister? How come you're not like your friends? And we close our mind to the diversity of a person's growth. This is how you should grow. This is how you should do things. And so that makes us close our heart even more, even not just for your friend, but even for yourself. Um, you are lucky enough to come to the practice, and the most important thing is to be able to embody that practice so that you can help your friend to look within and not to tell him things from the outside. This is not a, the practice is not something topical. You don't just put it on like a cream, and it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so you can tell him everything, but it, even if he applies it, it won't work. But our practice is to come within and to look within. And if you are that friend, you can hold him and be that energy of mindfulness just to listen when he has something that, it's manifesting from within that is coming out. Then you can embrace him with your energy of mindfulness. Um, 
So your ability to come within yourself would determine his ability to come into himself. Because the only way out of any situation is inwards. And the addiction to whatever it may be could be a means to run away because it's too scary to go within. And so they have to run away to other things on the outside. I have had friends uh, addicted to drugs and sex, and they didn't know it at that time, that they had suffered so much, and they made everyone else around them suffer. But if you, if I were to judge them because of their addiction, then they would feel they have no one left in the world. When they already feel abandoned by everyone they thought that had loved them. So love doesn't mean, or understanding doesn't mean you just sit quiet and accept what is happening. Yes, you can embrace and accept what is happening, but compassion is the willingness to do something about it. And sometimes that doing something is doing nothing but sitting there and listening. I hope that helps. Dear Thai, dear respected teachers, sisters, and brothers, um, it's so nice to be here with you in this space. Um, I have a question related to um, maybe in a daily learning and education setting where we have so many awe and wonders that we observe from our teachers and people who are willing to inspire us with their insights. Uh, I feel that's something that keeps me coming back to this place, which is the awe and wonder I feel from people around me and the rituals and tradition. But as a student uh, in a school setting, I also have this feeling of awe towards the teachers that are teaching me school subjects in you know, university setting. Uh, but different from a monastery setting, I feel there are also a sense of equality involved in education that we have to constantly learn, stay awed and inspired, while maintaining a sense of equality and boundary and exchange our insights together. But that's posing a trouble, because I'm a very emotional person, and when the feeling of awe arises, I feel the sense of respect and awe just takes over me, and it's really hard for me to um, engage in a very equal sharing or maintain this sort of exchange. Um, so my question broadly would be how to, um, in a teaching setting in general, how um, do you have any advice in balancing the sense of awe, respect, inspiration um, with the sense of having this sense of equality and exchange equally? Thank you very much.
May I ask you, uh, what, can you share more about what do you mean by the equality of having, you have to work together, you have to share your idea? It, and usually in university, I remember, it's very competitive. But here you're sharing equality. What, what is this? So like, well, it's a sort of like a um, hierarchical st structure, right? As a teacher, you should have a higher stance in the students. They also expect students to share about what they are thinking about equally and maybe sort of like you said, like work together yeah. and yeah, in a sense, forming an idea together. And the, uh, how to uh, deal with that when you're overwhelmed with your awe? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think they go together. I mean, maybe your awe and your teacher's awe, can, you, your awe can affect your teacher. And I remember in architecture school, uh, I'm most inspired when I'm with a teacher who is like as curious as I am. So I think the important thing here is um, in the practice, we say not to lose ourselves. Right? You know what I mean? It's like sometimes we're awe and we're so inspiring, we lose ourselves. Meaning we are no longer uh, caring about how it's affecting other people. Yeah? And so you kind of like are very isolated in your awe, which is sometimes good. But if you begin to uh, work in the environment, in community, in teams, sometimes our awe uh, diminishes other people from maybe their little awe, because they're so afraid of your awe. <laughs> yeah? You understand? So it's important to also think of sometimes there are little awes that there, but if we just awe a little bit less, the little awes can awe. <laughs> and then it is a, a something you experience much more, how do you say, more, um, hmm. so it's no longer, yeah, I, I know that feeling because I, I train as an artist, architect, and we were all about passion. Yeah, passion or die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I learned through Thai and through the practice, uh, we can have this very internal, beautiful inspiration, but not lose ourselves. Sometimes I still lose myself, and it's okay. But it shouldn't be the only way. Because uh, I notice that when I'm overwhelmed uh, by that awness, that uh, inspiration, that passion, uh, I take away opportunities of others, you see? So pay attention to a little bit of that. So in terms of balance, it's not hierarchy, but it's equality, and equality means don't overawe. <laughs> yeah? So you allow little awes to awe. I hope that awe is correct. <laughs> awe is with you, yeah? A little. All right, thank you. Yes, you learned the lesson. Dear brothers, dear sisters, dear Sangha, um, one year ago, 
I cut contact with my biological father because we came to a very fundamental difference where I didn't feel like I could live life without embracing my emotions and expressing my emotions. And he was at the time incapable of changing his way of thinking where he would go through life without ever giving voice to his emotions. Um, six months ago, I made him begin therapy with me. And we've been doing therapy for six months. And I've noticed um, proof of a tangible change. We're going to be meeting for the first time in person again in a month. And I'm very afraid. Do you have any advice? Dear respected Tay, dear brothers and sisters, and dear friends, six months of therapy, I don't know what kind of therapy that you have come through, but uh, I think if you're ready, then you can meet him. If you have learned something, from the retreat and you have practiced something. We are always afraid when we don't know what's going on. But you will not be afraid if you can understand yourself. Ask yourself a question, are you ready for your father? Don't ask the question has he changed? Because that's probably, nobody can guarantee that. But you can guarantee that you have changed. If you learn enough so you can be more stable, more patient, you understand the practice so you can breathe in, Breathe out, follow your breath, and compassionately can listen to him. You can learn the art of listening, no matter what he's going to say. But you still root it into your inner strength. Those are the things that you can do. It's difficult to know how the other person will be. And uh, of course we hope that uh, the meeting will be very fruitful and helpful for both of you. But the more important thing is you have to prepare for yourself. You have to see that whether what you are going to say to him coming out from your love and you understand, not from the judgment that you are still too different than me and we cannot get along. But instead it come out from the vision that both of us are interconnected. When you are not happy, I'm not happy. But one thing I can do is if I can take care well of myself, I can have peace, then definitely you can penetrate that peace to him. So instead of worry about that meeting, prepare yourself on the practice. See how much 
you have changed. See how much ready you are. I think those are more important because only when you feel that you are yourself and you are ready um, to bring compassion and understanding to him, then all conversation will be much easier. But if you guys come up with the, the idea to see like you are wrong or I'm right or vice versa or oh, it has been six months but you don't change anything, then I don't think it's going to work. So I don't know for how long have you practiced, but if it can bring you some fruitful inner peace, stick with that and prepare yourself well with the practice. And you know, everything is possible. Life is impermanent in a very good way. If you can change, he can change. But don't have high expectation. Do you want to add anything, please? I would like to add just a little bit more. Um, in fact, I don't think you're going to meet your father that day. You are actually going to meet the child in which your father brings up in you. So are you ready to embrace yourself? The child that has suffered through trauma, and through feeling whatever the child went through. So you will meet him again, not your father. And whether or not it will be okay, is whether right now you as an adult can tell the little boy inside of you that it will be okay and that you will hold his hand and that you will breathe with him and allow that little boy to trust you. Homecoming, to the little boy's homecoming. Dear Thai, dear community, my question is about practicing with difficult emotion, painful emotion. Uh, yesterday I had a lot of that come up all at once, so it felt really big, and I wanted to practice with it, and I had read a book by Thai about um, you can bathe a big emotion in mindfulness, so I was experimenting with feeling what was going on on the inside and noticing the thoughts and bringing in the birds and the wind. And I recognized that that was very soothing in the moment. But my question, I'm just left wondering if that simple, beautiful practice is enough for healing and transforming long term or if there's another practice you recommend for healing, like that deeper pain?
Do you respect the Thai, dear friend? What's your name? Christy. Dear Christy, thank you for your question. And thank you for your practice. You've been embracing this difficult emotion, strong emotion. And you want more, more of that. Huh? So it did something, I guess. It relieved something. You approached it. You reached out. You allowed it to be with you. But it has not transformed yet, disappeared, died. It is still, like the fragrance of it is still there, the air of it is still there. Difficult emotions are so beautiful because we have to like confront ourselves with them. It's not like, they're not one of these kind of emotions where we say, yeah, you know, now I don't have time, can you come back tomorrow? They're pretty sticky. So this first step you did to allow it to be and to sit with it was a wonderful step. I don't think you will be able to transform this emotion, future emotions, difficulties, all by yourself and actively. But what Thay says, as practitioners, we are gardeners of a garden of flowers, of plants, of trees, that cultivate the soil that plant seeds and create conditions for these wholesome seeds for transformation and healing to happen. So don't... That's what I'm saying from my experience. I'm telling myself, basically I'm speaking to myself. Don't try to force healing. Don't even begin to think that you are the healer, that you, it's in your hands to change it, because with that it comes the expectation that I will say when it is enough, and I will determine the degree of healing, and I will determine how much I can take, and what is a good difficult emotion, and what is a bad difficult emotion, and an unnecessary one. So that estranges me and alienates me from myself, right? My difficult emotion is me. And you embraced it, you recognized it as a part of you. And when we look at it, this difficult, if you look at it, Christy, this difficult emotion came up because of conditions. Because maybe the gardener was busy, like preparing and watering some, some seeds and flowers over there. So in this side of the garden, conditions happened to arise that this difficult emotion said, now it's our time, you know? The gardener looks at the other side. The parents are out of the house. Or just maybe the other way around. She's at a retreat now. She has peace. I can sense there is space in her heart right now. She never has time for me. Now is the time for me to arise and show my true self. Show her show her, her true self. Come up. And you were there. No, it came up and said hello, and you said hello. Now this is a beautiful encounter and needs to be cultivated and kept fresh and kept watered and nourished. You see, I don't know why I'm a quote person and I always have these images or stories. There's the little prince. Do you know the book, The Little Prince? And when the little prince visits the fox, and uh, the little prince says, I want to be your friend. Now see, the fox as your suffering, as your difficult emotion, and the prince is your awareness. I want to be your friend. And the fox says, that's not so easy. I'm a wild animal. You know, I'm a beast. You cannot just like befriend me. We have to do that slowly. And then the prince asks, how I can do this? And he said, you have to come every day at the same time and bring me something to eat. But stay away, don't come too close, because I might bite you. 
huh? because I'm wild. But if you come every day, and every day you can come a little bit closer and don't forget to bring something to eat, huh? <laughs> which would be your awareness, you know, your presence, your, your readiness. I'm here. We cannot force an orange to be sweet. You, know, you cannot stand in front of an orange and say, I want to eat you. No? In three days, I need you to be sweet you know, because I want to get rid of this. And especially with humans, it's not working like this. It's so organic and that's so beautiful. If you just go in that human rhythm with acceptance and openness. You want, if it's in a pot, you want to put the orange in a sunny spot. You, know? you want to water it. You want to say, I love you, orange. And I'm looking forward to the day you're asleep. And the orange will do the rest. The same is true with difficult emotions. And some might be older, deeper, more unacknowledged than others. You will see that with some it is easier, with some it is more difficult. And maybe you want to invite. This is a difficult one. Maybe you have one in pedal, you know, in line. That's not so difficult. And you can start with that. And you have already a sense for it. And it's easier to invite it. And then you say, hey, you, now, come on. We make a group, a group hug here. I'm ready for you, too. And you can slowly approach it. But it's never over. I'm right. There's this uh, arriving at home, and I'm asking the question for someone. Also, turn it down. I had to turn it up because I couldn't hear. Her. I, I just turned it down. <laughs>
be a part of it, regardless of the series of difference. Thank you for your question. What kind of home do you want to come home to? Would be my question for you. When we speak of I have arrived, I am home, it doesn't necessarily mean an actual structure of home. Many times that during this retreat, we have to have many exercises to come back to ourselves, to come back to our breathing, being aware of our body, being aware of our emotion. And that is coming home. And sometimes we're not comfortable being at home with our body. And there's a lot of the young adults now who suffer through body shame. choice of what can nourish us. And if something is nourishing us, we will always come back to it. So if your mind, your emotions, if you know how to water the seeds of joy in everything that you do, you can still be at home. No matter where your physical body may be. I had just come back from my uh, two months and a half travels. I was not at home in the monastery. I was living in the city almost very similar to couch hopping <laughs> on retreat, staying at lay friend's house, sleeping on a different bed. But I was still very much at home because I enjoyed walking meditation with my own body. It's not where I walk, it's how I walk. It's not what I eat, it's how I eat. It's not how many times I do meditation. The numbers is how one meditation nourishes me. And so that then will become that source of joy and arriving. So the idea that you're going to go home to where your husband and your kids are and you really don't want to be there, that's a different kind of home. But you can also be in there and be very much at home. So it's not the external conditions because uh, almost we all have the same external conditions. But we need to choose our internal conditions. Become your interior designer to create a space in your own mind where you feel safe and quiet and have a sense of peace. And whatever your body is doing, whether it's eating, walking, sitting, 
lying down, you are still at home because you can enjoy that space outside and within. And the first thing, this is what I shared on one of my Dharma talks, is the first thing is that you have to marry Kondo yourself. It means that what doesn't spark joy, let go of it. Things that doesn't spark joy inside of you, just let it go. And then you can choose things that spark joy. And you have a place to come back to. If you have recognized there's a habit that you do, you overeat, let's just say, I'm a foodie, so if you eat more than you are, then after that you feel so full. And then your body feels exhausted and tired. And you know, Mary Kondo, that I'm going to eat mindfully and slowly and to listen to my body. And so there are some habits that we do that we can change to make ourselves become more at home. But remember that things that spark joy, we should keep for ourselves. And the more you have joy inside of you, the more easier it is to come home. And the simplest way is to slow down a little bit. It's just to slow down enough so you can see what is making you more tired and exhausted. And that's where mindfulness comes in. But in the monastery, we train ourselves to walk slowly, to sit and breathe, so that we can slow down our mind just enough so we can look inside our interior design to see what is really causing us anxiety, fear, anger, and we can Mary Kondo that. Dear Thai, dear Mother Earth, dear community, I know we are a practice and a people that arose out of the Vietnam War. And I see that there were times when Thai and his students practiced to the very best of their abilities to bring the message of peace and that there were times when they were not understood. My question is how to practice with the suffering of not being understood, especially when the stakes can seem very high?
I've been asked to clarify what I mean by the stakes. Um, like when it can seem like the issue at stake when not being understood has a lot of consequences to it, or when there is a strong fear or response into the experience of not being understood. And what, what is the situation? Okay. It can be understood on, on a number of levels. Um, and I think it's maybe with the interbeing of both political and also very personal. Um, I see it sometimes in the the experience of my family in Okinawa when we go to the military bases um, to bring as best we can a message of peace. And that sometimes, even when we practice to our very best, the message will not be understood. It will be projected in the English news in the opposite way sometimes. Or maybe sometimes will not be seen at all. <laughs> um, and I see too that this question applies to a personal level um, because there are times, for example, within like relationships or personal practice, um, for example, with family members who have uh, a mental illness, where causes and conditions are such that they will not be able to understand. And I want to know, I suppose, how to keep one's heart and practice alive with freshness, even in the face of the fear of not being understood. <laughs> You know, since uh, our teacher has transitioned, I've been hearing a lot of uh, reference to uh, when Thai came to the U.S. to call for peace. And he was at a, a news conference. And the news person asked Thai, why are you, you care so much for your country? What are you doing here? Why don't you go back to Vietnam and save your people? And I remember... Uh, and Thai, everyone now loves the part where Thai shared that he actually went outside afterwards and he had to take a breathe, a breather. And there's something about that that everyone like highlights because it's, it's like a re revelation that, wow, Thai also got upset. <laughs> and he like almost blew up. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, Thai's human. <laughs> And I remember the main point is that Tai, in that moment, didn't feel that it would represent the people that he was speaking for if he shared in anger. For me, that's the most important part, that he was practicing. Not that he didn't have anger, but that he was practicing to know that how he shares through these newspapers and how he shared that it is in this place, this country, where the root of the war is, going back to Vietnam. So in his clarity, he was able to see the interconnection of things. If he allowed his anger, he would react it personally and maybe said something. And that would have been detrimental to the movement of peace because if you're fighting for peace, you get, you're not peaceful. But afterwards, Tai goes out, Tai, and takes a breather, and, you know, someone followed him. And Tai shared to him, like, yeah, I almost blew up. And I have to come out here, really breathe, and take refuge in whatever that spiritual practice Tai had. So for me, he... Actually, I wish he shared how he... Uh, 
calm down, cool down, and return to a place of compassion, forgiveness for the news person that asked that. So I think that's the most important part is how we deal with people who are misunderstand us, and it's okay because that repeatedly happens. I don't know if you notice. This, you know, you go around asking people to understand you. You're, you know, you're bound to. Uh, so I think uh, being awake is uh, to awake to that, that actually we do our best each time. And we need to each to create a place of refuge that no one knows that we can go back and access. That is the home. As long as you don't lose that place that, mm, where you can revitalize yourself, revitalize your compassion, your aspiration, your bodhicitta, whatever you call it. And also touch that insight of interbeing, that their misunderstanding is very part of this journey. That's the hardest part. Mm. There's a part of me that likes to uh, remove all the parts that are, I don't like. The people don't understand what the whole purpose of this whole thing is. Just uh, you, you hear it on the news, like, why are they even... And there's a strong part of us that uh, uh, is very dualistic. So the hardest part for me is to sit with that person that... Uh, element that is uh, I want so much um, that's the hardest part for me is to accept that how we call the mud as well the misunderstanding and I think that is over all the years has helped me become uh, a little softer on myself because I'm also very hard uh, in demanding understanding and that has caused uh, a lot of people around me, a lot of suffering. And I continue to do that, and I recognize, wow, that was harsh. And I forgive myself, and I take care, and I try my best not to do it again. So it's not actually them not understanding me, but it is my little steel inside that wants, why don't you understand me? And that's really violent for myself. Um, and so I touch the earth. I begin anew with myself and continue to do what I need to do to uh, uh, help make the world better. So it doesn't mean I retreat, but I continue to do what I do after I revitalize my, that uh, mm, that motivation, that aspiration. And I also notice when I am taking care of myself enough and when I engage with people on these different issues, topics, or, uh, and I confront that, I have more space for their misunderstanding. And so that's, uh, you have to learn each time. You can't just keep going and making the same mistake. So I think the word now is resilience in the activist movement, the racial movement, the gender equality movement, all these. It is very important for us to prepare ourselves first, like the freedom fighters and the civil rights uh, movement. They prepare themselves to be misunderstood, to be spat on, to be blamed, to be so on. So in the same way in, uh, in our work for peace, mm, prepare yourself, learn, what did I do? How could I approach it softer? So this is something uh, uh, we need to continue to do, even though we are continually misunderstood. We don't, you know, retreat, keep going, <laughs> and be more skillful and more softness. And... You know, the farmer doesn't stop, continue to make uh, the new season, right? So that's the image that's helped me. We're all farmers, continue to till. One season doesn't produce a lot of fruit, really bad fruit, but next year you don't give up. Got to start again, 
put new tail, new soil, new seeds. And you, you don't stop doing that. So please uh, continue your uh, work for peace and know that you always uh, have a place of refuge here. And I know home ultimately is everywhere, but you know, Deer Park, the monastery is also your home. And it is a very uh, safe and protected environment. And we love to see you and your partner coming here all the time and sharing with us your music. So thank you for your work, huh? And we support you, okay? Know that we right, we got your back. <laughs> I would like to add a little bit. Um, don't forget to continue what you really believe on and do it, but don't forget to nourish yourself. Because sometimes we are so much in to do, and we forgot of to be. So um, nourish yourself in the environment where you can. And also looking deeply and see what really can nourish you so you can go forward and more stable. Thank you. Um, dear Sangha, um, I have a question on uh, developing balance in developing a home practice. Um, I feel that sometimes I can swing to um, spending time with my suffering, but in a way that I kind of get really focused on it, in a way that I get a little lost in it. And then sometimes I can swing toward really trying to remind myself of all the conditions for happiness that exist, but in a way that's actually kind of trying to push my suffering away and tell myself you're not allowed to feel like that because there are all these conditions for happiness. Um, yeah, so I would love some advice on um, where, where in a home practice and like how much to like consciously and like actively focus on like directing my mind toward the conditions for happiness there are versus like being present with whatever arises um, exactly as it arises without trying to control it. I thought the practice was supposed to be 24-7. Um, I think we practice all the time, whether we know it or not. And sometimes when we think a formal practice of sitting meditation half an hour every morning before you go to work, and then Sometimes you can do that for a week, and then after that, just say, no, it doesn't work, I'm just too tired. I'll do it after, before I go to sleep. And then we try to move the practice from one time to the next. 
But engaged practice is not about setting aside another time, but really integrating it into every single thing that we do. Uh, I, I, earlier I shared it's not whether where you walk, it's how you walk. We walk every day. It's not like whether or not you f- make your bed in the morning, it's how you make your bed in the morning before you leave the house, if you make your bed in the morning. <laughs> like, that can be a practice. And just to know that you get to come home later on and your bed is already made and just, you can just plop on it. And so where do we find that balance of um, enjoying the moment to moment and watering the positive seeds and looking deeply? I think there's two sides of, yes, you have more than enough conditions to be happy. And there's the other side is knowing enough. How much of that looking deeply into our suffering is enough? And to be honest with ourselves. I mean, because sometimes we all use the practice, you know, I mean, to be honest, we use the practice, and if we're not skillful, the practice is a means for us to actually run away from suffering. It's like, oh, here comes anger, and I'm going to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, and just, okay, anger is gone. And because we're afraid of what anger can do. Um, maybe at that moment, it might not be wise to burst in anger, but later on, when that emotion has calmed down, you said, okay, anger, so what's up? I'll listen to you now. And then when you feel the feeling of not being understood and not having a voice starting to come up in you again, you said, okay, so I understand. Okay, but I won't go in too deeply into she said, he said this. I did it and start to blame yourself and to blame others. And you think, okay, I understand that there is suffering there, and this is enough for today. And when I'm ready, then I will invite you up again. So it's not to say that you cannot absolutely not look at your suffering, whatever the suffering may be, and just only focus. The practice is supposed to nourish. When you nourish your happiness and joy enough, then automatically the suffering will also become softer and more gentle. And then when this becomes softer, you can invite, okay, suffering, can you come sit with me? Let's have some tea. I think earlier our brother shared, like, can you befriend your own suffering and your own pain? We should not use the practice to push it away, for sure, because then you neglect a whole part of you. The, we only want to acknowledge the lotus and just ignore the mud. But the moment you cut the lotus flower away from the mud, the lotus itself will wilt. So you need to have both. And then just be aware of when is enough. How much is enough? And he said, I know um, my niece, she has a little box. And I didn't know, I never taught her anything, you know, never made her do meditation. But I was cleaning her room and I saw this box and had these little scrap pieces of paper in there. And on each, I just, being the nosy aunt, <laughs> I took a little scrap and I just read it. And it says, watch two YouTube videos, like whatever, TikToks that makes you laugh. And then, or go out for a walk. Another one said, light a candle and just lie in your bed for 10 minutes. And out of curiosity, I asked her, so what is this box? She says, sometimes when I'm just so mad, I promised myself I would take one thing from that box and I would do exact whatever it is. Whether it's just light a candle and just sit quietly or just lie in bed for 10 minutes 
And that's what I would do because at that point my, my suffering is so much when I'm so mad. And I just needed a moment to breathe. And it's okay. You don't have to finish your anger in one sitting. Okay. Anger doesn't really disappear. But if you're besties with your anger, the anger will become very comfortable and tell you why she is angry. So sometimes uh, if you listen to your suffering enough, they will tell you what is really going on. But if you try to run away from it, either with the practice or with indulging in something else, it won't let. The practice is to listen. And then you can do that in every moment, not at a specific time, a specific day, or when you come to Deer Park. When you're eating and then you see something, or you remember what your boss had said to you earlier and you get angry. He said, okay, anger, let's eat this carrot, chew it mindfully, and then I'll sit and talk to you. We're going to enjoy this moment together, and then we'll have some tea. Mm. So any moment that arises, you can become aware of it. You don't have to push it away. So that's what engaged Buddhism is about. It is not a separate place, a separate time, but it's just in every single thing that you do, that you are aware whether it is happiness or joy or suffering or despair, and just smile. It'll be okay. Big circles, one direction, make some music, mm. feel your clavicle clapping, <laughs> uh, now reverse, big circle, so nice to know our body. Dear teacher Thai, sisters, brothers, community, I am new to Zen Buddhism, and I don't know very much, um, but approximately one year ago, I read Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet, and it affected me so deeply um, that I resisted. <laughs> And uh, that previous question uh, essentially was part of what I was going to ask. And so now, um, what I'd like to share and ask is, um, I've explored different religions and practices. Um, Tibetan Buddhism taught me meditation, compassion, mindfulness, 
This last year, I spent time with Christianity uh, and Christian mysticism in Quest Haven, where they have a beautiful nature preserve. And yet, and not and yet, I find myself here again, uh, just my questions are twofold. One is, what is a teaching or practice in Zen Buddhism for apologizing and asking for forgiveness? Um, because I acted in ways that um, I feel um, was a little too enthusiastic with some of my actions relating to Zen Buddhism. Uh, and I apologize for that. My second question related to Zen Buddhism, have any of you, before you entered in as sisters and brothers, did you explore the religions? Uh, and finally, my question, because this is where my heart is opening, <laughs> is the role of the Sangha. Uh, that I have found that there's well, this is my, my experience. I haven't found something like the Sangha. So can you practice Zen Buddhism, engage Buddhism without the Sangha, that that's part of the practice? A lot in there. Thank you. Dear respected Tay, dear friends, and dear Veronique, uh, you're supposed to ask only one question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll answer one, and if you're not happy, then... <laughs> okay. Um, when I decided to ask Tay to ordain me, his first question is, can you accept the Sangha? And I said, of course, even though I, I didn't really know what it meant by the Sangha at that time. Uh, but I think the, the real meaning of the Sangha is the more you practice, the more you can find out what it means and how much it can support you. So on the physical aspect, yes, the Sangha can be people who are at the same vision, same um, idea, and would like to support you when you are down, or you all can uh, encourage each other to practice and get nourishment on the path. But in another aspect, the Sangha is your body. If your body is in harmony, that's already a big sangha because you cannot practice much if some part of your body is really painful. And you have to get support from your mind to overcome the pain or the support from other parts to, uh, to help balancing of the uh, witness. Your sangha can be the environment. The nature can be your sangha. Books can be the, just your sangha. Anything that can help you to go on with the practice and nourish you can also be your sangha. When we mentioned about the word it's a sangha, then we thought of people. But I don't know about your condition, but when you have that question, then I would like to, to say sometimes the condition is not enough and we have to be by ourselves. Uh, now we can have a telecommunication, but sometimes we don't. The main question you have to ask yourself is, do you really need a Sangha? And if your answer is no, then you have to look back and see more clearly why.
because I do believe that you are me and I'm you. I'm also somebody else. And they all can become part of me after the retreat. So no matter what, we, we are into our, we nourish each other, we help each other to, uh, to all go on with the practice and bring peace and happiness to other people. So the more we can do, the Sangha is bigger. And it's not just what we can do, but it's actually what the whole Sangha do. So whatever you are doing, whatever your accomplishment is, it's not yours. It's probably come from also your ancestors, from all the favorable conditions that allow you to do that. And they also your Sangha. So I just want to be short, but this is a topic that can be explored a lot. And I believe that with the, the meditation and deep looking, you can find out your Sangha is everywhere, in and out. I think uh, we have another one. <laughs> the line keeps on growing. It's like the bottomless line. <laughs> okay, so we'll see how, how much we'll go before we can ask the question. We'll listen to one sound of the bell. Thưa Thầy, um, thưa Sư Cô Trân Công, con cảm ơn các Sư Cô và các Thầy đã giúp cho con tìm cái nhiều hạnh phúc và bình an trong cuộc đời của con. Dear Thầy, dear Sư Cô Trân Công, and dear all my brothers and sisters, thank you so much for helping me find the happiness and peace in my life. For 15 years, I was in chronic depression. I lost my mother. And when I met Thay, he taught me how to drink tea. <laughs> I thought he was going to teach me something more profound. But he just made me drink tea. I was blessed to drink tea with him. And what he taught me was just open my eyes to see the blue of the sky and more recently the white of the cloud and I think that's where I am today. My question is a little different. At this point in my life I feel beyond blessed. I work in the medical field and a lot of times when you have depression you're always taking care of your patients your kids, your husband, but you would lose sight of yourself. Today is Mother's Day. I left my kids and left my husband at home because I wanted to feed my soul and my practice. I, my question is, how do you embrace the immense gratitude and the blessing that comes with the practice? And how do I embrace the next chapter in my life to lead and take on a role that is bigger than I would imagine? Thank you. 
in Deer Park here is the first time there was a Sangha form by mothers uh, during a family retreat. Uh, a few mothers came up to me and they said, Tai, can we speak to you? Uh, we would like to have a retreat for just the mothers. Because that retreat, we had a beautiful sharing in the par- for the parent group. And there was a lot of suffering that the, the mothers would have to bear on their shoulder that is expected of them. And I remember they, they also shared like there's like this competition to like raise your kids to be the best. So this is kind of like this competition to be the best mother. <laughs> it's crazy. Bay Area, you know. <laughs> it was crazy, you know. I never heard of such a thing, you know. That they wanted to, you know, they were competing to get how many events in the weekend for their kids, and they compare about like, oh, they're in this whatever ballet thing, they're in this, 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 and so they formed a sangha. It has a really cool name. It's called Dharma Mamas. <laughs> <laughs> I think I don't know. Are there any Dharma Mamas here? Yeah, there, there's one. There's a. It was a form. And their first retreat here, I got to be a special guest. And it was a bunch of single mothers. They left their home and their husband at home with their kids. And so it was just the, the mother here. And it was so, so healing. And I think we need to continue that awareness that uh, having, I don't want to say has, uh, having it, this culture, this society, the way it's set up, it's not very supportive of, uh, of uh, you know, raising children. So there's a lot of pressure, this, things, this tension that's in, unfortunately, in a lot of women. And so it's very beautiful to, to support that and they express that need. Mm. So I just want to acknowledge that and, you know, thank you for being a mother and, yeah, did, did your best in this society. It's really tough to be a mother or a father or a, 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 care, a, a, a family, a leader of the, the, the family structure. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's today's, uh, let's bring that forward, you know, uh, to give support to that. Because there's this expectation from society as well as an inherent uh, cultural transmission, uh, generational transmission that is in us to always try to please and to do better than others. Mm. So I think for you to come across the practice, I don't know what you mean when you know your next role is, and be very careful uh, in how do you call it in. Mm, it's that striving, uh, yeah. So when Thai asks you to drink tea, is to let go of that. Uh, many of us have sat with Thai, and we have uh, something prepared to ask Thai or to tell Thai a project or something, and Thai just, hmm, let's have some tea, Kong. <laughs> <laughs> and then Thai knows we want to go, and says, let's have another cup, Kong. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, okay, uh, you know, I'm finishing my cup, I'm ready to go. And then he's like, let's go for a walk. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I think it's okay to do what we need to do in the stage of our life, in the next step that we do. Mm, But be careful that it is not like stomping. You know, take a gentle step. So don't put burden on yourself or expectation, or uh, look into that. So having time to meditate, to come in touch with Thai, and drinking tea with Thai, you, you, that, that other stuff, striving, anxiety, fear, or whatever it is, I'm hoping for you, is that insight that you have to approach it very differently than you would that has caused you know, internal suffering and so on. So this is, uh, in general, I think, for for all of us, um, taking gentle steps, rather than, you know, you making a lot of noise with our steps, like, I'm going to do this, 
right? So whatever next stage it is for you, allow it to, uh, mm, how do I say, um, yeah, gently blossom into it. All right, and don't, because our culture is very striving and achievement oriented and being recognized for things too. So this, we got to re, uh, re, I don't know, how do you call it, but <laughs> it's caused a lot of stuff. And I've heard it from children to teenagers. They come up here and they share. There's so much expectation from me, from my parents, from my Asian aunts, uh, relatives. And a young boy shared that in our last teen retreat. And so this, they feel so much pain from that kind of culture. And it's like not, it's not okay to just enjoy and like not be like A plus all the time. And so we have a lot of that as well as parents. Uh, what our relatives say, our family members say, our neighborhoods, our so-called friends. So I think drinking tea and wasting your time, being unproductive, useless is good medicine yeah can you handle that like oh man today is such a useless day I produce nothing I'm just in the garden on a hammock allow yourself to like do nothing I think that tea that I gave you please remember that that's the message waste your time drinking tea and be guiltless. Don't, your life is so precious. And that is what you're going to offer to your children, to your mom. You will not continue that habit that your mom had. It stops with you. No more running. I have no guilt to enjoy my life. Give your permission, give yourself permission to enjoy tea with Thai. So when you feel this come up, Make a cup of tea, make another one for Thai. And keep that. Because that will be, if you continue to have tea with Thai, you'll continually not lose that, what he transmitted to you, that happiness of simply being alive and having permission to be useless. I think we're a little bit overdeveloped. Yeah. <laughs> so I... I, I moved that from inspiration, what you shared. I think you had insight from when Thai offered you tea. Don't lose that. Yeah? That's very precious. I thank you for being a mother and a daughter. <laughs>
instead of just pure logic or opinions from people around me. Like, for example, my parents have put a lot of effort into building the steps for my life. Like, oh, if you do this, do this, and do that. If you climb up the ladder in the corporate world, if you get this job, if you achieve this status, then we will feel satisfied with our effort because we spent our entire lives building the blocks for you. All you have to do is follow these blocks. <laughs> it don't go the other way. <laughs> so, but then my heart, I, it makes sense to me. I even do pros and cons to consider all ways and like the situation of the world, the economy, and calculating taxes and everything. And yeah, they make sense. Like that will give me a lot of, you know, good returns, stabilities, like a good life to them. But my heart, my joy, says the other way. You know, like. Like deep down, I know what decisions I need to follow in order to feel like myself, in order to feel like this is who I am, this is what makes me happy and content. But then I need to be able to stand up for that little voices and be able to just be me and not be overthinking or having to defend myself so much. I would love to hear the sister's answer to that. <laughs> but since I'm here very shortly, I hear from you that you pretty much Basically, you gave the answer to your question while you were speaking, you know? You know your way, you know what sparks joy. The only thing is, how it can mute your parents, right? Everybody was laughing here because we went through the same thing. Like, our parents were building these blocks and said, here, this path is for you. And I'm like, nah, you know, that's your path. You built this. My path maybe takes the first few steps, but then goes in a different direction. And only I can know that path. And hearing you, only you know that path. Your parents built the blocks to safety, and you built the blocks to your inner joy and what you love to do and what you're best at, because you know you know your heart, you know what you want to do, what brings you joy, what makes you, you, what makes you beautiful. And your parents want that, but over that they want you to be safe. So the easy answer would be, whatever your parents say, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Not at your age. When you're five, you know, it's okay to follow. Yeah? They say, go to bed, you go to bed. They say, eat, you eat. But you're old enough, and maybe this is how you can reason with your parents, you know, I've been following your path and it's, and it's brought me here and it's beautiful. And now, my dear parents, I have this many choices. That's a big intersection for me and it's very important to me to go the right way. And I see you want the best for me. I see your intentions and I value them and I appreciate them. And without you, I wouldn't even be here. I would, I would like to ask one thing of you and this is you brought me here and to trust me that I know how to continue, that I know what brings me joy and that I also have my own safety in my mind. And in case you see I'm wandering too far off what your vision is for my life, we can talk, you know, and I'm happy to share with you my heart. But I would love for you to understand me that I want to blossom and I want to treat myself as I believe and who I am and that I find my way. I love to walk your way but it's your way and I walked it and now I see there are many many options for me to walk and 
uh, you brought me here, but now it's for me to, to make a decision to really walk my unique way so I can be happy but also successful. And then I'm safe. And um, I believe when you, when you say it like this in your words, you know, you were very convincing, you got me. I support you wholeheartedly. <laughs> Bring your parents here and we talk them all down together. No, they really love you, and that's, that's important also to, to remember. They do that out of love, you know? They don't want you to be the same. Like our parents, my parents too, they worked a lot to, to guarantee their children a better life. They want to make it always easier for the next generation. So we have to keep that in mind, acknowledge it, but also demand our own choices to also make it better. And uh, they see, then they can see the struggle they had with their parents and said, yeah, I know, you know, that's out of fear that I would just want your safety. And you say, I know and I love you for that. So now let me go. <laughs> Do the sisters have a word? I'm very curious so I can apply it to my own parents. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to add a few things. First, as an adult, we don't always have the answer to everything. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Because uh, there's actually no course in college for adulting. And I think every one of us in this room is still learning day by day. So we don't have to have the answer to what it means to be an adult. But there's one thing that we can always do, and I piggyback off of Brother Ngo Kham and what he shared is, your parents love you the best way they know how to love. Uh, I, grew, I was born and raised in America. I totally took an unconventional lifestyle. <laughs> of course, my parents said, oh, you can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can be this, you can be an engineer, you can... And then, lo and behold, I shaved my head. Uh, and of course they were worried, you know, she's going to be okay, but on the bottom line, they still are very happy for me because I am happy. And it's not easy. Maybe right now you have an idea of what will make you happy. Mm. We have an idea, you want to go towards that, and your parents, they have their experience. It's not to say that their experiences are invalidated. We can listen to their experiences and take it as our own, and not necessarily blindingly follow their experience, uh, because their experience comes from a different time and space. Growing up in Asia, through war, etc., maybe, like my parents were. So then the security and having enough food, because that was their fear of not having enough food, or whether they will get food for the next day during the war. You know, so then they said, when you go to your parents' house, they give you food all the time because they think you're hungry. Yeah? It's because that's what their suffering was. It may not be your suffering because you grew up in abundance, but it helps to understand why they act the way that they do. It's a generational suffering, a total different time and space. They may have insights from their own suffering, but it may not be the same like yours. But it doesn't hurt to understand where they come from. So when you do share your aspirations or your dreams, you don't blame them and criticize them for suffocating you so much or making them do follow their dreams. Because I also know that as a, a child of immigrant parents and many other immigrant parents here, they also had their dreams, and they couldn't fulfill their dreams because the conditions were not sufficient. 
And so instead of saying, I want to cut myself off from you and I want to do my own thing, you know, you can also say, I would like to learn your dreams. Can I hear your dream? And maybe I can fulfill your dreams also. My mother told me that, you know, I've always wanted to learn the guitar. <laughs> I didn't know that. You know, because she was always focused on work and raising her children. I didn't know that she had this artistic side in her. And so I said, okay, we'll see what we can do. You know? So then those things, will, our differences can bring us closer together rather than use our differences as something to pull us apart. So your aspirations or your, your path or your journey may be yours, but it doesn't hurt to open our eyes and listen to what our parents, their greatest concerns are, and also their greatest dreams too. Because we, as a, myself, as an American, uh, Vietnamese American, I've had many conditions to be whatever I could have been. But I, I didn't even become what anything that my mother and father had on their list. <laughs> I don't think any of us here has had your child become a monastic on your list either. <laughs> you know? And I tell you, it's the best job. <laughs> Um, but yes, so listening to yourself is one thing, but also understanding your parents and why they do these good, why they act in certain ways, so that you, what may seem to be different can bring you guys closer together. And then you won't be too torn inside of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, yes, yeah, question from the heart. I think we've all been nourished by this journey, this human journey. We can hear each our lives in each one of their question, and that's what the uh, the Dharma is about. Mm, that the we really into our in every question. I think we see ourselves in it, and it's so beautiful to come together occasionally to do this, to reflect together, to find ways to move forward together. And we want to thank everyone for coming for the retreat, coming for the day. Um, let's think of our, all our mothers, all our fathers, all those people who are playing those roles out there the best they can. Uh, and let us continue to support each other uh, as we raise the next generation of young people. So we'll uh, end here uh, with the sound of the bell. And there'll be a few announcements, so please uh, uh, just uh, hold it. Maybe one sound of the bell, yeah? As we uh, massage our legs, uh, I've been asked to uh, announce that the, the brothers, we are, we are having a fundraiser, I think, in the last uh, few months. And we are raising funds to help build, uh, extend our residence. We are getting more monks, but uh, uh, we need more rooms for them. And it's wonderful that our teacher has founded this place, this uh, refuge, for many people that come up every Sunday, and to also renew a kind of a, a monastic order, as you can see, the monks and nuns. We 
we're quite uh, involved with society and we go teach and we have many retreats here. So we do need more help. Many parents and families came up to me and asked me, can we have more family retreats rather than just one week? This week, it was sold out in like a few minutes. And many parents were so disappointed because they've been waiting for so long. I said, well, we will have more retreats if you give us more monks and nuns. <laughs> <laughs> There will be, uh, as you know, running a retreat is, uh, takes a lot of effort and, and so on. Um, so please, uh, so as we continue to uh, expand and grow this community, we're doing it quite, uh, actually moderately. This is, we haven't done much in terms of building, but the brothers are uh, wanting to build a new uh, extension of the resident that we're on. And the, we, the plan check is going and we're raising, we need to raise about 800,000 and we raised uh, more than half of that already in our efforts. We had a hiking retreat, a hiking, a hikeathon here and then we had a music festival here. So quite re uh, crazy ideas. Uh, the brothers are using that to do fun stuff. <laughs> give it to the, uh, say that we're fundraising. But the next event, fundraising event, and we need your support is next week on Sunday. So rather than come here, you go to Orange County, right in the middle of the city of like total uh, in, in some park. So all the monks and nuns will not be here, will go there, and Suko Chang Kong will be there. So we would love, and it's a mixture of Vietnamese people and non-Vietnamese people. So I see a lot of non-Vietnamese out here. Please uh, come and support. And uh, I think there's a few people out here. They have a little sheet of paper with the QR code that you can, uh, at the door where you, they'll be handing it out. And so you can register. It need, the registration is the su support that the, 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 uh, for the fundraising, that event. But it's also a community building event. You go there, there'll be Dharma talks, a question and answer. As well, it will be a panel sharing about the intercultural and intergenerational dialogue between, that's in our, sangha, our diverse Sangha. So it's a very uh, beautiful uh, uh, content program for, it, for us. Our Thai is very uh, revolutionary in reviving Buddhism, not just for the Vietnamese community, but for the non-Vietnamese. And we're so lucky that we have so many people coming from all kinds of background. And we can improve on that diversity, of course, always. But please come support that day. And bring, uh, I think if you register before maybe Wednesday and Thursday, you'll get a sandwich. <laughs> a, a lunch is included, but we gotta close. They, they, we, I, I've been asking them to extend that, keep extend, because it's actually a bunch of sangha, like people like you making the sandwiches in their homes. So that's the way they're offering it. So please uh, register as, you, as, you, as soon as you can. And it's a sliding scale thing, uh, whatever your family can, uh, are able to help in terms of the fundraising. So it's all fun. Please uh, come. We need more non-Vietnamese to take over uh, square, Miles Square Park, okay? Because uh, I'm sure there's a, bit, a lot of Vietnamese there. But I, I like them to see the non-Vietnamese practitioners. And we'll be doing walking meditation and it will be very healing for the, this uh, intergenerational um, cross, crossing each other's borders, yeah? So thank you. Uh, Kenley? Yeah. Uh, dear Thai, dear Sangha, uh, just to give a... It's, it'll take less time to make the announcement. Um, so the, the uh, lunch will be picnic lunch uh, because there's been some confusion about timing. So we will just go with picnic lunch. So find a place to enjoy your lunch uh, together. And as you leave the hall, please pick up your mats and cushions and move them to the sides. If you have a chair, put them in the back. And if you're outside, please help put all the folding chairs away. There's a rack on this side of the hall and a rack on that side of the hall. So thank you. Enjoy your day. <laughs>